Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and a member of PMDG's tech team. In today's video we're going to talk a little bit about the operational flight plan and we're going to cover two different operational flight plan formats. So, I know that many of you are using the default Lido flight plan from a Simbrief and first of all, this actually is a fictional flight plan format. There is no thing such as a default Lido flight plan in real life. So what Simbrief did with this one is to take the average of all the uh, flight plans that they had available that used the Lido flight planning system and then they built more or less an average of this uh, flight plan. And that is what we can see over here. We are also going to cover another format that is especially relevant for you 737 flyers out there and that is the Ryanair format, seeing that the PMDG 737-800 is not too far off. So I know that many of you are going to use that one, so I'll briefly cover that one as well. So first of all, what is important in your operational flight plan? Well, first of all, of course, you have to find all the information that you need for your FMC programming. I have already done an FMC programming tutorial, so I will not go into too much detail about the FMC programming itself over here, but I will briefly cover what you need to know for it. So, for the FMC itself, basically the FMC guides us through the menus and shows us everything that it wants to know while, um, we, ha while we are setting it up. So, starting on the root page over here, and in most OFP formats, but especially in Lido formats, we have this route setup up here, basically where we get our de departure and destination ICAO codes. And then when we go to the second page, we usually get a route ID as well, which then corresponds to the company route name that we would find in our FMC if our company was using it. Now. This one just says default root, but if we look for example at the Ryanair format over here, then it would say root ID Munich Dusseldorf 01. Now, Simbrief usually exports them with a slightly different naming format, so in Simbrief it would be Echo Delta Delta Mike, Echo Delta Delta Lima, without any number. Going on then, in our flight plan, we have the performance information down here, and that is especially interesting for us. On the upper row it gives us the maximum weights and on the lower one the estimated from our flight plan. And that is important to take into consideration during your uh, pre-flight. Because first of all you have to make sure that your actual weights are in limits. But that gets especially important when we get to the maximum landing weight. So in here we are planned with uh, 50.4 tons while the maximum allowable is 58.6. Now imagine you had bad weather at your destination and you would take some extra fuel. Then you would always have to compare the uh, new estimated landing weight with the maximum structural landing weight and make sure that that is actually within performance uh, limitations of the aircraft. Talking about performance, of course you would also have to calculate your dispatch weight because the maximum landing weight you see in your flight plan just as the maximum takeoff weight are always the structural weight limits and not the performance limited weights. We usually find our ATC call sign on the top left over here, in this case Air Berlin 501, to be performed on the Delta Alpha Bravo Lima Alpha, a 737-700 with CFM 56-7B engines. Then we have our um, column on the top right over here, which tells us which cost annex we are going to use, what the ground distance is going to be, what the air distance is going to be, and the air distance is basically the distance that the aircraft is going to travel within the air, which, depending on the wind component, is going to vary over the component of the ground. And then we also get our great circle distance. That is basically, if you would take a map and draw a direct line between two points, that is the great circle distance. We have our average wind component here that goes into the performance field. Uh, sorry, our average wind. And then we have our average wind component, which in this case is minus 31. And basically, you either have plus or minus designating the um, strength of the wind here, or the speed of the wind. And basically that tells you what to do with your speed, 
So minus 31 is a headwind of 31 knots, so you have to subtract 31 knots from your average uh, speed, uh, sorry, from your actual plant's true airspeed to get your average ground speed. Then we also have an average deviation from the ICAO standard atmosphere of plus 7 degrees. And for the 737 up here, it would give you the uh, top of climb outside air temperature based on ICAO standard atmosphere. And then if it says, for example, plus 7, you take that value and you add 7 degrees to it. Below that is our average fuel flow. Now that is very handy to compare to see if your aircraft is actually performing as expected. But you have to be aware that early within a flight, so for example when you just reach your top of climb, it is likely going to be higher and when you reach your top of descent it's likely going to be a little bit lower than the expected value. Below that is our fuel bias and that is basically a performance factor that's applied to all the fuel usage for every single aircraft in your fleet or for a certain fleet of aircraft within your fleet. So basically if it is at zero then Simbrief is using the exact performance data of the manufacturer. Now in real life aircraft don't usually perform exactly as per the book. So it might happen that an aircraft might be using 1% more fuel and then you would find a fuel bias of plus one in your operational flight plan. Going a little bit lower, it tells us our alternate airport, in this case Amsterdam, and then we have our flight level steps over here. Now this one is an important one, because the performance information that you find up here, especially the um, data on the ICAO standard atmosphere deviation, etc., is dependent on those uh, flight levels here. So you can see we are planned initially at flight level 320 and then at waypoint Ospit we are planned to do a step descent to flight level 240. Now we have to take into account that the average fuel flow is of course based on performing all those step climbs and step descents. So if air traffic control would not clear you down to the lower level but keep you up high then it might very well happen that you will encounter a significantly lower average fuel flow than you would if you were to use the um, plant flight levels. Going down we have our fuel section. Now this basically comprises of the legal fuel requirements for the minimum takeoff fuel. So we have our trip fuel of 2447 kilos and a plant trip time of 1 hour and 6 minutes. We have contingency for 5 minutes and that is 185 kilos. Now be aware that if you were to use different contingency procedures here, for example if you were to use uh, 3%, then you would also have your planned en route alternate shown beyond the um, 5 minutes over here. Then we have our alternate fuel, and our final reserve fuel, and that adds up to the minimum legal takeoff fuel of 4,879 kilos with 2 hours and 18 minutes of flight time. Extra fuel down here can be anything that the company determines that you might have to take. So, for example, if you fly to a destination where holdings are usually expected, then your company might add a certain amount of fuel in there. For example, it might tell you 11 minutes of extra fuel due to expected holdings. That value is usually averaged out by the company and then determined by the airline. And that leads us on the line below to our expected takeoff fuel. To that we add our expected taxi fuel and that gives us our planned block fuel. When you are actually filling out your flight plan within the flight then you would uh, write down the total fuel that you have loaded, subtract the block fuel from that and that gives you your pilot in command extra fuel value that you are going to enter over here. And then you also have to write down the reason why you took that extra fuel. And for example in my company you can have up to 200 kilos without having to give an extra fuel reason. But if it's more than 200 kilos then you have to write down why you took extra fuel. Now for example you could simply write down weather at destination and of course there would be no questions asked by the company. For your FMC as well then you have your final reserve plus alternate and that is basically the number that you're going to enter into the reserve field over here. So this would always be rounded up, so this becomes 2.3 tons. And then in your reserve field you would enter 
2.3 like this. Then of course we have to acknowledge that I have performed a thorough self-briefing about the destination alternate airport, including the applicable instrument approach, procedures and so on, and that is basically what has to be signed by the pilot in command. Those telephone numbers you see over here, by the way, they are purely fictional, so don't even try to call them. You're not going to reach any dispatches. Going down to the second page then, we first of all have our alternate airport information. In this case, Amsterdam has been planned. We've got a routing to that, a planned flight level, wind component, time and the fuel required to do that. Also, we have our final reserves over here, so that is the 30 minute reserve. If you are going into that, you have to declare a mayday. Below come MEL and uh, CDL items. So an MEL item could for example be that uh, coverage of a flat motor might be missing on your wing and that could potentially increase your fuel usage by a couple percent and stuff like that would be written down in this section of the operational flight plan. Then of course we have our routing over here. The route ID is as, explained, uh, as explained, sorry, and then our routing itself in case we want to uh, enter it manually. Below that is a field where you can write down your ATC clearance. And now comes a section that is really, really underestimated by flight simmers. That is the operational impacts section. So let's go over what that actually means. We'll start with the weight change up 1.0. That basically means that your aircraft is going to weight one ton more than the expected or planned zero fuel weight. That could happen if you have a couple of uh, passengers that are just joining on the very last minute because in real life operational flight plans can easily be planned like 12 hours before the flight. Anything that changes after this might fall into this section. And if your zero fuel weight was to be actually higher than the plant zero fuel weight, you'd go into here, you see, all right, if I'm waiting one ton more, I need an additional 31 kilograms of fuel. So that way you can determine if you are actually able to fly the flight with the amount of block fuel that you've loaded, or if you might need to refuel. Be aware that we have a weight change for one ton over here. If it was to be more than uh, this one ton, I would call the company and request a new flight plan to be calculated for the new weight. Similarly, weight change down 1.0, we see we, we would save 36 kilograms of fuel. And then we have our flight level change block, and that one is especially important. And let me tell you why. First of all, it tells you if you were to go higher by 1000 feet, you would actually use 7 kilograms more fuel. And that is important because if air traffic control asks you what your requested flight level is and you're planted level 320 over here then you would tell or then you would check the FMC is likely to give you a higher flight level but the FMC does not take the different winds and the different uh, temperatures into account which the flight planning system however does the FMC might tell you on the optimum uh, tab on your VNAV cruise page that your optimum will be higher than level 320, then in this section of the flight plan you can determine that even though the optimum altitude is higher, due to the short length of the sector or due to different winds at the higher altitude and so on, you would actually spend more fuel going to that higher altitude. Similarly, we can see over here how much extra fuel we are going to take in case we have to fly at a lower altitude. Now that, that comes in handy if you have a longer sector and you can't get your planned altitude, then over here you can see how much extra fuel that's going to cost. Also note the uh, time fields over here. So, for example, it might happen that it is going to use a little bit more fuel to climb to a higher altitude, however the aircraft might be flying a higher speed over there. And any time savings that you may want to achieve are shown in this column over here. So, as an example, let's say you were to run a little bit late because of some unnecessary ground delays, as our company loves to call them. Then you would see that if you go a thousand feet higher, you're actually going to use seven kilograms more fuel. But if you could achieve a time saving, so for example, if this would say time minus two minutes, 
then it might very well be worth the consideration if you still want to go to that higher flight level. Also up here you can of course see if you are actually going to achieve, achieve a time saving when you think about a step climb. So flight level 320 as planned for this fl flight is a rather low level and that means that we might actually fly a higher Mach number if we climbed to a higher level. And that is very tempting for the pilots because it will suggest that, well, maybe I spend 7 kilos more fuel as shown in this plan, but if that means that I can fly quite a bit faster, then hey, I'm gonna do it nonetheless. However, the flight plan is telling you the truth over here, and that is, if you go a thousand higher, you're not gonna save any time. Similarly, if we go down here, we have the speed change block, which shows you the speed for cost in X0, and you're actually going to save 64 kilos of fuel, but you're going to fly for three minutes longer. And then it tells you your speed change for cost in X100, using 119 kilos more fuel, but saving four minutes time. This one becomes especially important when you are thinking about whether you might do a diversion if you arrive too late or too early, for example, due to a curfew. So this block tells you then if you are if you're running really late, your destination airfield is about to be closed because of night curfew. Then in here you can see okay, if I go cost X100, it's gonna cost th this much more fuel, and I can save these many minutes. And that actually comes in very handy. Going down then to the next page, we can write down our ATIS over here. And we also have the RVSM altimeter check. Now that is something that we had to do a lot in the past, but nowadays our authorities, at least for my company, have lifted us from having to do the RVSM altimeter check and write it down. So we still do the check, as in you look at the three altitudes that you see in cruise level and they have to be within a certain amount of uh, feet from one another. But earlier on we had to write that down like once per hour. That is no longer the case. Below this we get our estimated and scheduled times. So basically estimated is what the company thinks that you'll um, actually take and scheduled is what is in the commercial schedule. So in here we can see we're estimated to take an hour and 29 minutes but we only have an hour and 25 minutes block time, so likely we're going to gather some delay. Alright, so going a little bit um, down further than the weight section, the leader of P over here basically gives us one very interesting information, and that is over here, the possible extra fuel that we could take. In this case, 8.2 tons. So this is taking into account all our performance information, determines the most limiting factor and then it actually tells us all right so with this most limiting factor in uh, question you could take that much extra fuel and if we look at our particular flight we have a zero, zero fuel weight of 48 tons the maximum is 55.2 so that means we could take about 7.2 tons extra for the fuel we have five tons with a maximum of 13.3 and now you are going to say, but wait a moment, the tank capacity of the 737 is a bit greater. And you're absolutely right. The reason we have this limit over here, adding up to a possible extra of 8.2, and yes, I know that this is 8.3, so I don't quite know why they say 8.2 over here. Probably to give you a little bit of margin. Then we say, then we can see how we are uh, takeoff, how our takeoff weight is uh, comparing over here. But now comes the uh, limiting factor over here, and that's the landing weight. You can see that in the takeoff weight you have a margin of about uh, 8.3 but then in the landing weight you have a margin of 8.2 tons. And that's why it says over here possible extra fuel is 8.2 tons. If you were to take more than this then you would exceed the maximum landing weight. Below that terrain clearance check that's unfortunately not available in Simbrief. And then we're going down to our uh, flight log, and there is a little bit of interesting information over here. First of all, you have your estimated fuel on board and the burnt fuel at your estimated waypoint. So that is very important for the fuel checks. You write down how much fuel you have, you write down how much fuel you burned, and you can 
and you move it to the used position. Then over here it tells you how much fuel you have used. In this case, 80 kilograms, because we're standing on the ground at the gate and have reset it. The next interesting section over here is the estimated time over at and the actual time over at. So once you're airborne, you would write down the actual takeoff time in here, so up here, and then you would add it up to uh, with the amount of minutes here to determine at what time you're supposed to reach which waypoint. That way you can determine if you're flying faster than planned or if you're lagging behind the plan, and that helps you to make your decision when you determine the amount of fuel on board. Also in here, another interesting information is the minimum off-road altitude. So, for example, at um, our top of climb over here, it's 4,100 feet, and that is within a corridor of 10 miles to the left and to the right of your route, the minimum safe altitude that you can fly. So, if you had to deviate from your route for any reason, then you could go down to 4,100 feet in here. Another important information you find in the flight plan is the shear factor, that is this one. And you can see that right on the top of our flight log, it already tells us the most critical minimum off-route altitude of 4,500 feet at waypoint Gizem. So you know that at Gizem you are going to have the highest terrain. And then the maximum shear factor of 3 at Amosa. Now the shear factor basically indicates if there is any turbulence expected along your route. The shear factor is calculated by looking at the winds above and below your planned level and comparing them to the winds at your planned flight level. So that means that if your flight level is um, has a certain strength of wind, but there is a huge difference to the wind just 2000 feet above, then there are chances that you're going to have some turbulence. And that's what the shear factor determines. Basically, values of a 1 and 2 indicate that there is no turbulence expected. 3 indicates that you do have some uh, stronger turbulence expected. And we can see it over here at Amosa. That's exactly what has been uh, set on the top of the plan as well. Maximum shear, 3 at Amosa. And then... 3 is an indicator that there might be some turbulence. Now, I've seen values as high as 17, so that kind of puts it in a contrast, but anything from 3 onwards, I would brief the cabin crew that there may be a chance for turbulence. And the higher the number gets, the more likely it is that you're actually going to run into turbulence. Finally, there is one more interesting piece of information on the flight plan, which I can show you up here, and that is, you have the name of the waypoint, as well as the identifier. And that is interesting if you fly over a navigational aid, like a VOR or an NDB. Because if you have an NDB or a VOR, like we have over here, it's called Mike. The identifier in the FMC is Mike India Quebec, and it's on a frequency of 426. And that gives you an idea of what your NAV-8 are actually called like, because our traffic control could easily refer to a NAV-8 by its name rather than by the identifier. So if they were to tell you, for example, proceed direct mic, then you can have a look in the flight plan and you're going to see that, ah, Mike, okay, that's Mike India Quebec. And I can find it on this frequency if I want to. That's especially handy if you have, for example, a VOR en route, so they could say proceed direct Dinkelsbühl and you'll be like proceed direct what? and you look in the flight plan and you see ah Delta Kilo Bravo VOR okay I'm going there only if you go down a little bit more there is one more f interesting piece of information and that's the wind information and why is that interesting? well that's because if you wanted to do a step climb and the operational impact section a little bit further up might not be available. So it does happen that it just says operational impacts not available. And of course the operational impacts are only calculated for one or two thousand feet above your planned level. But if you wanted to go like really higher then you can have a look at the um, wind blocks over here. So for example if we take the waypoint Ibarga we are planned at level 320 and the wind over there is 316 at 51 with minus 45 degrees of temperature. 
But if you were to go 4,000 feet higher, you would find the wind at uh, 57 knots and minus 55 degrees. So that's something you can take into account when you're thinking about doing a larger flight level change than the one that's actually planned in... or the one that's covered by your operational impact section. Below that, we have our ATC flight plan. That one's not really interesting for you as the pilot. And uh, from there on, we get to our weather information and so on. That basically concludes the look at the Lido flight plan. Now, let's have a quick look at the Ryanair format as I promised you earlier on, because... That one is simply very often used by um, Simmers just because Ryanair is one of the biggest 737 operators, most certainly the biggest in Europe and I believe the second biggest in the world, just beyond Southwest Airlines. So you will notice on the first look that it's actually very similar to the Lido flight plan, so I'm only going to cover some of the differences and uh, some of the peculiarities of this flight plan. And that is, um, you will recall that in the FMC setup tutorial I told you to enter the top of climb wind. That's something that we didn't have in the Lido flight plan. So what you have to be aware of in the top of climb wind is that it always comes from the first top of climb in the uh, flight level steps section over here. So if you were planned to do a step climb so if the initial flight level would, for example, be 240, and only thereafter you would go to your uh, cruising level, then the top of climb information over here would come from the 240 step climb. So it always comes from the first top of climb in your route. Now, you can still find your correct top of climb wind, just as the uh, top of climb standard atmosphere deviation, by the way. The same applies to this one. When you go down to the nav lock, you find the top of climb that actually corresponds to the altitude that you want to fly and in there you're going to get your wind and your outside air temperature. Um, sorry, outside air temperature of course is not this one, that is the um, wind component, but this one up here. Another interesting piece of information that you can find in the Ryanair flight plan is FIR boundaries. So if you were to cross from one country into another it would tell you at which waypoint that would happen. And then you can mark that waypoint on the fixed page just to get an idea where you can expect an ATC frequency change. Apart from that, what's slightly different here is that the operational impact is a little bit less, but it shows you flight level change 2,000 feet above and 2,000 feet below versus the 1,000 feet that we had in the default Lido flight plan. Apart from that, they are really pretty similar, and there are no major differences when we look over the uh, Ryanair format over here. What we do, however, have is uh, this section down here. That actually is a section that you can use if you had to manually determine your takeoff performance. Ryanair used to do that in the past because they have been one of the very late airlines to start using an electronic flight back. I mean, it costs money after all, doesn't it? But eventually they figured that iPads are cheaper than carrying 50 kilos of uh, takeoff performance charts with you. But if you had to do manual takeoff performance calculation, you have this uh, section available in the flight plan that basically tells you, hey, um, this is all the figures we have to determine over here. All right. Apart from that, they're really similar. So I hope that you have found this one interesting. If you have more questions about the operational flight plan, please put them in the comments below and I will endeavor to answer as many as possible. Also, I've just set up a new Discord server like a week ago, to which you can find an invitation link in the video description below. Finally, I hope that you have enjoyed this video, I hope you found it interesting and learned something new, and I am looking forward to welcoming you again on the next one. If you are really loving it, then I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you very much for joining, and I'm looking forward again on the next one.